welcome to episode 42 of Infrastructure Matters. It's just me and Cam- I say just me and Camberley today. It's obviously the Camberley show that I get to co-host. Hey, Camberley, how are you? I'm good, good. Actually, I'm doing pretty good. I got some sleep last night. So. Oh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> we like that. We like sleep. Yes, I, I feel your pain. So we've been on the road this week. I'm going to go to you first, Camberley. You've been at it, Dale. We, our team was scattered to the four winds this week. I think there was Twilio, there was Dell, there was <clears throat> IBM. I'm going to cover the IBM piece. There was earnings, the back end of earnings sort of and coverage as well. So we'll get into that. But I'll Nutanix. Give you, and Nutanix. We had team out at Nutanix. I think Informatica was this week as well. I don't know whether we had that. We were joking about it this week that there's just this is the week. I think there was eight events running this week. So let's, without further ado, let's go to you and Dell. Lots going on. So, Dell, big show. It was all about multi cloud, hybrid cloud. Just kidding. So, they didn't <laughs> talk about AI at all. No, no, they just skipped right over it, didn't even talk about it, whatever. It was all server <laughs> feature, server and storage speeds and feeds and no AI. Well, the, the curious thing is they did kick off with talking about PowerStore, but everything was really about AI. Um, PowerStore had a major release. That's what, for those who don't remember, this is their follow-on to Unity and Clarion and all their, their famous stuff, you know, the, the core one of their major systems that they have. Um, and then they released a, a QLC version. They released a lifetime, you know, trade up to the cert, to the controller kind of capabilities. Um, they did a big software release on it that boosted up in terms of performance. Um, and that's a freebie to everybody. So you download your software and off you go and you get a whole bunch more performance. So it was um, a really good announcement for that but the really big bulk of it um but congratulations to the power store people for getting that one out it's a great system um is uh it was all the ai and this concept called the ai factory and i will have a little bit more detail i know bob Suter is writing up on the ai factory and what it is and etc but what you know, I was pre-announced on this. We were pre-announced and pre-briefed on it before we go to the show. And I was kind of like, okay, thank you very much. It's a nice architecture. Thank you very much. Here we go. Yeah, you're building boxes and you're integrating systems. But this is what the really important thought process was. And that is that we are going to be standing up a large environment that will eventually be a very large environment that will be driving and creating this data that is coming out of these these analysis systems. And those systems are gonna be, yes, they're gonna be some of the training piece of it, but the big bulk of the business is gonna be long range, is gonna be the inference engines. Mm -hmm. And that is where we're going. Um, I'm gonna give you some stats here um, that they cited as as coming from their research. Um, I sat down and talked to Mindy Cancillo, who's talking about how they've been developing this research, but, they see that 83% of the data is on premises, 53 is coming from the edge. Um, what that means is that if you're gonna develop an AI system, you're gonna move the compute to where the data is. Mm-hmm. And the data today is still on premise or most of it. Um, and uh, that's what they found. That's what they know they have to do. You know, They've been implementing some generative AI systems. Some of it, for instance, um, customer service they or website chatbot kind of thing where I mean you have to move that processor to where the data is in there and they've got to be close together because you can't you cannot stand the latency that's going to go over you mm-hmm. know a, you know big big line on that so with that the other thing that they did and this is their fu- the future between 2027 tw- 2030 they expect the um, compute to exceed um, 27 with 30 zeros following it. If you can imagine how big that is, that flops. That and this is going to be for the AI piece of it. And to look at the amount that it's going to be is that this is going to be 75% of the data center requirements is going to be for AI. 
and they expect that 90% of that is going to be inferencing. 10% will be training, but this is, you know, we're going to train and then you got to get to the execution of it. So they're looking at where is this going and what do you have to do in order to set up this AI factory, if you will. And when they think about factory, they're thinking about I'm inserting data and I'm outputting <laughs> the inference engine information. And that's why they that's why they're calling this an AI factory. And the fact that it's so much technology that has to go in there in order to drive that. And this is, you know, the entire company is behind this in, in walk step. I mean, it was very clear. You didn't have this group over here doing this, this group over here doing this. You've got their It was entire really thick. They were kind of all on the same page. Right. And they're all on the same page from a product management, starting at product, actually starting with their own systems internally, working through product management, requirements, R&D work, et cetera. Um, you know, it's some, coming from the top, um, but with major leadership from Jack Boudreau, who runs the, you know, the entire AI solutions piece of general manager. So really, really um, significant um, effort on their part. I'm, I'm going to give a shout out to one of my co-analysts um, out there, a gentleman by the name of William Fellows, who works for, for 451 nowadays. And we were in the meeting with um, Jeff Boudreau. <laughs> And at first I kind of giggled at it. And then I said, God, he is right. Um, but it was, and he's right about not just about Dell, but about the entire tech industry is he said, and I may not quote exactly. He says, it, it's like AI has rescued Dell from multi-cloud. And I said, oh, it, it, the entire tech industry has been, because you know last year we were kind of talking AI, the year before, it was all multi-cloud. We were still talking multi-cloud, but you know this this wave that's going on right now, and over you know many many years, if you buy off that this is going to play out, yes, it's a huge massive investment um, that all the industries are going to be making. Yes, there's going to be bumps in the road. Yes, there's going to be problems. But you know, how do you stand up not only the, the systems such as Dell is going to deliver, but also the capabilities that IBM is going to be delivering, you know, that, which is really the software layers and all those pieces, because there's some big sticky wickets in terms of like the data pipeline problems that have to have, have to be addressed, you know, in terms of the training and the model and everything else. So with that, I'm going to mention one other item and then I'll pass it over to you because I know I've been talking straight for like 10 minutes almost, it feels like. I'm hanging on every word, so I'm sure the listeners oh, are oh, too. Oh, good. Let's, let's go. So. The, the one of the items that they announced was with Hugging Face, mm -hmm. and this gets into the modeling piece of it. Um, with Hugging Face, there is now a, um, there's Hugging Face Dell Enterprise Hub there. What they've done is they're putting up models up there um, that you can go download, go, go download. There's specific, some of the vertical or use case models. You can download it. I mean, it's super easy. Um, or at least when they demoed it, it was super easy. You download that, you can select the processor you want to drop this thing on, and off you go. I mean, this is the kind of things that innovative kind of things that they're looking at doing to say, you know, what can we do to streamline this, even though primarily the company is a infrastructure matters company. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're an infrastructure company, um, but they're looking at all the different things that they can do because they have felt the pain of trying and successfully in some bumps in the road successfully setting up some major use cases that they know are having huge impact into the company things like developer velocity which is the coding kind of capability content everything content you know cutting down and getting accuracy up to 90% of their content is a whole lot better in terms and also with the people that are dealing with the content, customer service, website, um, assistance, et cetera. So all of those things that they're, they're looking at and they're having to go through this process of saying, do we have repeatable, stable, systematic, simplistic processes that we can actually train something on? And then do we have the data to do that? You know, 
And we're in the deployment phase of AI. We're past the hype. We're in the deployment phase. Yes. And, and the pain is going to be in, in, in not only just the pain is going to be in setting this up, setting those environments up, which they're heavily addressing how to set up all the networking, the servers, the, you know, and create some flexibility within there. And then they're also moving up a bit of the ladder to say, can we help folks on those other pieces, which have to do with what's going to happen with the data management piece of it, what's going to happen with the model model recommendations. So really great show. Um, I, I usually can come out, you know, poking at a few things and that kind of stuff. But this time around, I was, um, this time around coming out of this particular show, whatever. Um, yes, it's, it was extremely, you can see the energy in the company and the enthusiasm in the company. So, well, I mean, it, I think there's a whole bunch of research notes from what I see in our channels that are going to be coming out. So I'm going to be looking for those. It was kind of a shame that Dell and IBM ran their shows at the same time, because I think you would have had as much of a good time mm -hmm. at IBM as you obviously did at Dell and vice versa. But, you know, pivoting to IBM, IBM had Think this week. Smaller show than some of these big Uber sort of 40,000 people shows. Intentional by IBM, I think. There are, I think, two or three versions of this format of Think. There's not the big sort of multi-vendor expo. It's all IBM. It's all mm -hmm. consistent. It's all very well themed. And I think that's enabled them to tell a really good story and a really consistent story. IBM is now laser focused on two things, hybrid cloud, AI. And we're starting to see that come through in all of their discussions. And, you know, there was some really, really good presentation by Rob Thomas that talked about what they're doing in the hybrid cloud space. Arvin took the a, more of the AI piece, you know, that very good sessions um, AMA sessions with Arvind and Dario Gill, who leads research, and and Rob and a whole bunch of the team. But it's really clear that IBM's getting very, very focused now. And when started to see real depth come behind Watson X, so and that's consistently coming through the organisation. I spent time with Ross Morey this week, who runs the mainframe part of the business. And you can tell there's a connection point between what he's doing with research and Dario's team around an, a, a Watson X assistant for the mainframe. And that's he's on message, he's consistent, and he's connected to the broader message that Rob and Dario are running for assistants, for instance, across the whole business. So going back to what you're saying, this is where good leadership is. This is where this holistic sort of company view of we're all on the same page. You know, just to give an example of what this um, assistant is for the mainframe, there's obviously a huge skills gap. There's, there's challenges there. Mm -hmm. What they've done is ingested all the red books, ingested the support database. Yeah. So a huge corpus of data of all the support calls that have been logged been able to pull that together, put it behind a large language model, and then be able to present that as an assistant. I conservatively think that it takes you five years to grow a system programmer for the mainframe. And I think what they're doing is probably taken two or three years off the back end of that. So the ability to kick off tasks, be able to reorder tables, be able to actually not just query a knowledge base, but then actually do things and kick things off mm -hmm. in context of the assistant. They launched one for BI. You know, there's a whole bunch of these assistants that are now coming from IBM, all business focused, all sort of technology focused. So there's a real consistency there. The other key takeaway from me from Think This Week, as I say, Rob Thomas did a really good job I'm starting to see a pattern emerging around what they're doing in the automation space. I think IBM had some assets there. I think obviously with the Ansible assets from Red Hat, what's going to be coming with HashiCorp. But then when you bring that through to what they've got from a FinOps portfolio with Instana, Turbonomic, easy for me to say, and um, the cloudability stuff from Aptio, starting to see sort of those five assets come together 
in a really consistent automation type portfolio. That's going to be, I think, saw that vision for the first time from IBM this week. So that's going to be really interesting of how that pans out. Obviously, couldn't say too much about Hashi, but you're starting to see the layer cake and that we're going to see AI and automation in that sort of software portfolio. Mm-hmm. I think another, I mean, kind of throwaway comment, but really helped me with the Q Radar divestiture. Mm-hmm. One of the analysts, I'll give another shout out, um, Ali Mellon from Forrester asked the question to Rob Thomas, how should we think about the IBM security portfolio post Q Radar? obviously moving to Palo Alto? And Rob gave me a really good answer of, we're going to get out of some of that threat detection kind of, I don't track this space, but sort of XDR seam type space. Mm -hmm. And we're going to focus more in on data security. So he talked about Guardian and that sort of data flow, obviously foundational from an AI perspective. So IBM is going to retain its focus there. So that was the first time I'd kind of heard the Guardian still important to us, data protect, data and securing that data layer was foundational. So that's fascinating for me. I mean, I think another key thing that came out of it, and I met with AWS at the event, a really strong focus on getting IBM software onto the hyperscale providers. If you wind back five or six years, Mm -hmm. IBM was trying to be a hyperscaler and compete on IaaS. Complete shift. IBM's now partnering with those, what they see as IaaS providers and saying, running what's an X on AWS. So is that mostly for development though? I mean, is it mostly that they're considering that, are they, are they looking say, because I know there's a bunch of mainframe stuff initiatives that are going on in that place, but that seemed to be mostly a developer kind of space to play less of a running your entire operational kind of environment on the cloud. Yeah. So, I mean, from a Watson X point of view, I think it's, we've got really good models with Granite. We've really got that um, and 17 models with some really interesting performance data. I, I know from previous history, trying to get performance claims out of IBM and through legal is hard. So I kind of do believe the claims, some really interesting graph, granite performance claims. But to go back to your point, I think from that Watson X layer, yeah. IBM is not really caring where you run it. So if you've got an AWS relationship for infrastructure with EC2 and you want to run it there, they don't mind, whereas they would have minded before. So I think, you know, interesting kind of, pragmatism on the public cloud and some of those hyperscalers. So fascinating week, chance to connect with a whole bunch of IBMers from my past, but really, really fascinating to see how laser-focused Arvin's got them on hybrid cloud and AI. Wow. So back to you for Nutanix. I know we were, Paul was out at Nutanix. Actually, no, he wasn't. He was at something else. It's- Guy Courier was at. Oh, it's got our team was everywhere this week. So, how, <laughs> how did how, what, what's your? T- I've not dug into the new Tannic stuff. How did that go? Well, so, so the I haven't dug into Tannics at all, except um, Guy Guy was slacking me about something about Newtonics and Dell's PowerFlex, and we went, huh. <laughs> And um, so I said, well, let me see if I can find out more. So he's over in Barcelona. I'm in Vegas. So, you know, I, I, um, I, I raised, I was at the partner event. They have a, they had a great partner. They've got some great partners there, but they had a partner event and um, Denise Miller, they had a separate session after there was Q and a with the press and if it's press and analyst or just analyst, I can't remember. Anyway, so I raised my hand and I asked the question about PowerFlex and Newtonics and, and how they were going to position this with um, <laughs> their other products. And um, she had this look at her face at me, which was. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I'm really glad you asked that question. <laughs> Either that, well, well, I, it's a complete surprise. So, so the, evidently, Nutanix had pushed out the press release or announced it at their conference, but I don't think totally Dell knew because then late late that night or some somewhere around nine o'clock, I get the press release from Nutanix, <laughs> actually from Dell that Nutanix put out to take a look at what was going on. It's like, oops, this happens. Um, we've seen it happen before. But anyway, so it was, it was, it's a really interesting announcement. So here's what's going on. Um, and suffice it also, I want to say that at um, Dell, they really didn't talk about virtualization that the, you know, at all, okay. except for on this, you know, when I, when I got into this and this is when we kind of started talking to the virtualization strategy. Um, start first by Dell saying, you know, they're working on, you know, quite a bit of different areas, but what they're trying to do is make sure customers have, there's an ecosystem that they have that customers have choice. Mm -hmm. and they understand, they clearly understand some of the, the agony that's going on with um, the, the vSphere pricing or the VCF pricing, et cetera. Um, so they're working through there to say, okay, so what do the customers want to do? You want to stay on VxRail? you know, because it's a well-loved HCI, you want to do ABC, you want to do something else, we're, we're going to help you, we'll help you wherever you want to go. So the Nutanix one here is they have a, a product called AHV, which is their virtualization offering. And um, it's highly integrated. Um, mm -hmm. you, when you, when you, you know, grow it, you really grow compute and storage. And there, and this actually started a conversation a year ago. So this is before all of the stuff. This is not something that happened since January and the numbers rolled out where there are customers and, and Dell had customers that had Nutanix that had smaller pods, if you will, or clusters. They couldn't scale, couldn't bring them out. So they started having conversation about using PowerFlex, which is a, you know, distributed storage product. Um, also known originally as Scale.io. Um, but anyway, so how, how do you do this with PowerFlex providing a block block capability with Nutanix? So this is what, what they announced is the ability to use, you know, take out the storage that Nutanix has, put in PowerFlex, be able to scale this thing to a much larger environment. And to give you an idea about PowerFlex, PowerFlex is it's, it's a block device. It's not it's big. I mean, the, the average systems are in the petabyte sizes, um, you know, with 10 nodes going on that, you know, this is, it's not small. It's, you know, it's a big, it's usually a big, big environment that's going and being deployed. So this is going and targeting to the very, their larger customers, you know, the global 2000 mm -hmm. area that have got those environments and they want to bring those offerings to market. So okay. nicely done. So, yeah. Interesting. I need to dig into that one. Maybe I need to spend some time with Guy and understand that the implications of that. As I say, we can't be in, we can't be everywhere all at once. You no, can't be no. at IBM, Nutanix, and Dell all at the same time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the final one on the docket here, and I'm just catching up today. <clears throat> Got a research note, kind of half written, collaborating with Olivier Blanchard on it around Lenovo earnings. So they announced Q4 full year and full year results, um, I think yesterday. Some highlights, up 10% year on year, which is impressive, I think, for those guys, double digits. Mostly from um, that AI stuff, or is that? Yeah, um, yeah. So I think, the, and this stat stood out for me, non-PC revenue mix. We get briefed on this. So obviously Lenovo's got a huge sort of PC business, a historic high of 45%. Um, so, so the non-PC revenue closing in on being half of their business now. Um, I think that's interesting for me because that says the revenue is coming from the data center and their services play. Um, all of the business units showed growth. So they split their business into the infrastructure business, all their data center, the devices side, and then they've got a services play. So those are the kind of three big chunks of Lenovo. All of those demonstrated growth. Obviously, AI starting to come through. 
did they mention any of this? I'll take a look at the transcript, but did they mention anything on the storage? Because, you know, they, they've done really super well on the entry level and they're trying to push up into the mid range mm-hmm. and gain um, market position there um, with their, their offerings that they have. Um, most of their offerings are, you know, they OEM them, um, but, you know, they're still growing that data center stuff. So from a data center point of view, up 15% in Q4. Okay. I mean, as you say, the storage piece, they're coming up those price in mm-hmm. tiers. Um, what are they number three now overall in revenue in storage? The mm-hmm. continual conversation we keep having with them is how are they going to get to those? Yeah. Maybe some of the traditional sort of power store type spaces you were seeing from an EMC perspective, you know, of old, how do they get into that type of a tier mm-hmm. zero, tier one type storage space? You know, I think they're doing a fantastic job of executing in those kind of lower price bands and the server connect type stuff. I mean, true scale starting to come through, services up across the board, you know, so double digit again on services. True scale's a key part of that. A lot of the stuff they're doing around some of the AI sort of um packaging pieces like you were talking about with Dell's AI factory mm-hmm. that fits into the services uh, solutions and services group. So solid numbers across the board. I think I, I get I've got my sort of quarter post earnings quarterly briefing today, so I'll get more detail on what's driving that. But I think what I think what came out of my comments from you from Dell and what I'm gonna see here from just my first blush reading of Lenovo is we're now into the deployment phase of AI. It's not some crazy POC where, you know, it's kind of like, let's throw some stuff up on the cloud and really sort of get uh, trials and POC stood up and lab environments. I think we're now past that. We're at the point where we're starting to see production deployment. That's starting to show through into some of the quarterly results in the strategy from what you saw from Dell. So I think we're probably now at the point where AI is starting to manifest itself in some of the quarterly earnings. Be interesting to see whether that growth continues quarter on quarter. Yeah. So one of the things I didn't mention um, was Dell's AI PC. Mm -hmm. And um, in addition to all the other big numbers that I threw out there, um, on terms of growth or where this market is going, they're expecting... P- all PCs to be revved, which makes sense between now and 2030, which is about 28 million, 28 billion, you said? How many was it? Tw- yeah, 2 billion PCs, 2 billion B- PCs, um, the entire PC inventory, which would make sense. But mo- many of those are going to be, or maybe all of them, will be have some level, they already have some level of GPU in there because of the pixels mm-hmm. and everything else, but we're looking at more powerful GPUs or MPUs in there um, to, to roll out. And in fact, uh, you know, we're seeing that, you know, huge impact um, on those systems as they're coming out in the market. So very. I mean, I don't cover the intelligent devices group stuff for Lenovo. Mm-hmm. That's where I'm collaborating with Olivier. Mm-hmm. I think Lenovo seeing that same trend in its devices business. Okay. And obviously they've got a, what they call pocket to cloud portfolio. Mm-hmm. So we're seeing that also from their Motorola business from, you know, so all the stuff that the Qualcomm's and the, those guys and the Broadcom's and those guys are looking mm-hmm. at the absolute far edge, i.e. your phone, that you've got to remember whilst in the US it's a, sort of 50-50 split between sort of iPhone and Samsung, maybe more even iPhone in the US. Other parts of the world, Motorola is a massive player. So Mm -hmm. that kind of, I think they're number three behind iPhones and Samsung. So, you know, they're a massive player in this market. So that Mm -hmm. kind of pocket to cloud play for Lenovo. So interesting. I'm going to be looking. For, I've literally got my Google Doc open, and there's a uh, Olivier's got to do his bit on intelligent devices. So we'll see how that pans out. But okay. fantastic week as always. I th- how we managed to get through that in 29 minutes is kind of beyond. I don't me. know. I, I have pages and pages and pages of notes, and I was you know trying to get it down to. I you know, the, I, I touched on page one. 
<laughs> I touched on, I, I talked page one and that's it. So you guys, well, you there's so job. much more that's, that's going to be rolling out here. So yeah. You, you did a good job on the summary of Dell. I'm interested to chat to you about what's going on there, but we always try and keep this to half an hour every week. Yep. So at that point, I'll wrap us up. You've been watching another episode of Infrastructure Matters. Please click and subscribe and do all those things to, and share it with your friends. And we'll see you next week. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.